Services Institute, and Francis is in Kensington. Francis, your question. My question is, um, I wonder how much um, arms they've been sort of uh, supplying the Ukrainian uh, uh, army so far. And also, I would like to just make a comment. From what I see and what I've heard, next week by this time, Vladimir Putin would have been, you know, pushed out of office by his generals because people in the army are now seriously considering toppling this man. So this is what will be happening by next week. All right, well, we'll hold you to that, Francis. Um, the, the question on, on supply of arms to Ukraine is a really important one if, they, if they're running out of manpower to anti tank weapons. Sure. So um, Operation Orbital was run from 2015 onwards, which is a big you know, UK training mission and provided a large amount of medical equipment training over a number of years. Um, we stepped up support to involve lethal aid uh, in the run-up to the current crisis. So that mainly involved ammunition, body armor and anti-tank missiles, animals. Um, we also flew in missiles and other equipment that other countries wanted to donate, but they didn't have the transport to get it into Ukraine, so we helped them ship it across. That was, the, was that the C-17s that went back and forth yeah, like exactly. a couple of months, maybe a couple of months January, ago, yeah. January, um, a month ago. Um, that was in preparation as the intelligence was coming in that they were lining the, 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 the armory and the tanks up at the border. Precisely. Um, and, you know, I think there were two sides to that. There was firstly the weapons, which are, you know, okay, useful, but also making the point to the Russians that Ukraine has international allies and we will back them. Um, and so the intent was to show the Russians that when we talk about the fact that we will impose sanctions and we talk about doing all these other things, we're serious. Um, unfortunately, the Russians saw that and weren't convinced. What about the the um, planes, the fighter jets that the EU has proposed possibly giving to Ukraine? Um, is that something that they would be able to use? Uh, be so, uh, so you know, uh, both Ukraine and Poland, both part, formerly parts of the Soviet Union, um, have some of the same kinds of fighter jets. That In 200 yards at Wagoners Roundabout, take the second exit onto the Parkway A312. And the Americans will then send modernized fighters to replace the Polish aircraft so they have the same strength of planes in their air force. Is that helpful? Is it useful? Is it? Uh, I mean, I think it? any support is useful, but once the once the Russians commit the, their air force at scale, um, there are serious questions around how long the, the Ukrainian air force will last. They, they don't have that many planes that are serviceable, and a bigger challenge for them is munitions. The Ukrainians have huge stockpiles of Soviet-era munitions, but a lot of them are out of date. And while that's not a terrible thing, if it's ammunition for your rifle, it might jam. If it's uh, a bomb that's on your wing and it fails to come off the plane properly, then it might well blow your wing off. So, you know, there are challenges. And the point was mentioned there about the generals around Putin, um, Gerasimov, Shoigu, those, those kind of people. You know, I think indeed we saw the, the um, ashen faces of some of those generals as Putin had them round his table not that long ago. What's your view of their view of this? I think the, the political leadership in the Kremlin are deeply uncomfortable with how this has panned out. Uh, I think many of them were warning Putin privately that uh, things might not go as he expected. And one of the reasons that we, we kind of get... Exit the roundabout onto the parkway. Come on television and kind of Continue on the parkway for one mile. ...announce their support for the plan. So, you know, if you look at the way he treated Marushkin, the, the head of the Foreign Intelligence Service, Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, it was, it was a bit of a dressing down. And I suspect that's because Marushkin had given a, a very pessimistic uh, assessment of what was likely to happen. Is there any, uh, do you see uh, there being any way whatsoever that some of these generals with the door shut, some of the bosses gone away somewhere else socially distant, that they might look at each other, nod and think, you know, this, this really has to end, this has to be stopped. It's a very dangerous thing to do. It's a hugely dangerous thing to do. Um, and I think that the question is, you know, well, what would the succession be? What would the, you know, you suddenly have to talk to a lot of other people to make that work. And talking to those other people is very dangerous, especially in an organization which is largely staffed by intelligence officers who are paranoid. Um, I mean, not it's not just military personnel. The, the person who's been overseeing this campaign, uh, Dmitry Kozak, on behalf of Putin, is a former... Russian military intelligence special forces officer, um, as are many of his other senior advisors. And so 
they they play that game of coup and counter coup a lot, and they're experienced at it. And I don't think many military officers would be hugely comfortable getting involved. Mm. And and to make the point again, if it's not gone very well in the first five days, everyone's a bit embarrassed. The generals look ashen faced. Putin's red faced with fury about how bad it's been. The only response is to be more aggressive. The likely response is to escalate, yes, absolutely, and to, to try and... Um, and of course the other thing is, in terms of who's responsible for it not going well, uh, those generals bear a significant amount of responsibility for, for the planning. And it's the operational and tactical execution which has not been particularly impressive. So, you know, it's, it's on them as well. Ollie's in Peterborough. Ollie. Oh, hi there. Um, just want to first start by saying it's very interesting listening to Jack talking. He's in a quarter of a mile at Cranford Parkway Interchange, take the second exit onto the M4 slip road to Heathrow Airport, M25. Um, it's quite obvious, well, it's becoming obvious that Putin has used this whole thing as an exercise. It's almost like a land grab. I don't think he's that interested in Ukraine. It's almost like a land grab to, to then move on to the next um, scenario. Um, you know, where, where he's almost testing quite a young army um, that they've got, quite an inexperienced army, it's almost like. Um, now, the, my question really is, just down towards, I think, for my, my feeling now is we have to start, you know, it's no point, like you were just talking about, sending planes and more ammunition to the poor Ukraine. Exit the roundabout onto the slip road. protecting Europe, they're protecting the gateway for Putin. In a quarter of a mile, merge onto M4. So my question really is, um, if we were to send more uh, troops, our own troops, NATO troops, around to the areas where we can, on the borders, etc., um, what are the options with things like um, no-fly zones? How, how would that be set up? And is it time to start at least moving people towards the border? A bit like what Putin didn't start with, he had people on the border. So NATO yeah, 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 encroaches yeah. a little further and, and as you say Oli puts in some of it has been asked for by, by the Ukrainian president which is a no-fly zone. Would that, would that fly? So I'm going to have to give a little bit of a long answer because there's a few different things here. The first one is uh, reinforcing... Continue on M4 for three miles. The speech didn't just talk about Ukraine, he talked about Belarus, Moldova and the Baltic states, the Baltic states being NATO members. So reinforcing that border I think is absolutely critical and it is something that's already happening. Um, moving up in order to make sure that this doesn't go further. Um, the second question about a no-fly zone is, uh, I think, very unlikely. And the reason for that is that firstly, you would have to choose to shoot down Russian aircraft over Ukraine. But the second thing you would need to do is start hitting air defense systems that the Russians have on Russian soil that sh shoot into Ukraine. And at the point where you're talking about NATO jets uh, bombing Russia, you are then talking about declaring war on Russia, which very quickly escalates. Um, and the, the other thing I would flag is that Russian escalation concepts start off with, with regional wars, which is what we're in at the moment as far as they're concerned, so a local conflict that's geographically bounded. Once you start getting into NATO outside of that region, conducting military operations and fighting the Russians, we move into what they would consider great power war. And at that point, tactical ballistic use and all sorts, uh, so tactical nuclear weapons and all sorts of other things, start to become the Russian doctrinal response to some of those activities. So there are very good reasons not to go down that path. Terrifying. Uh, Jack, thank you very much. Ollie, thank you for your question. Much more to come. 03456060973. Dr. Jack Watling is with us, research fellow for land warfare at the Royal United Services Institute. More of your calls after this. It's 6.30. News headlines on LBC. The Media Commons. More large explosions have been heard in Kiev hours following hours after the first round of peace talks between Ukraine and Russia drew to a close. Earlier, Ukraine officials revealed dozens of people have been killed in mass shelling in the second largest city, Kharkiv. These are all also being relaxed to allow more Ukrainians with family here to seek refuge in the UK. The Home Secretary says it will allow a further 100,000 people to travel here. And Boris Johnson has told President Zelensky more military support will be sent to Ukraine in the coming hours and days. The Prime Minister is travelling to Poland and Estonia tomorrow to meet his counterparts. LBC Business Update. With Direct Line Landlord Insurance. Come direct for Landlord Insurance.
price of petrol has gone up to a new record as Russia's invasion of Ukraine sparks concerns about supplies. The RAC says the cost of a litre of unleaded is now £1.51. pence. Diesel has climbed to 154 pence. LBC weather, rain moving southeast tonight, clear and cold elsewhere with isolated showers in the northwest, a low of minus two. LBC. This is Joe. Hello. Joe is passionate about flooring. Wood, laminate, even a classic textured pile. He loves his job and takes great pride in every little detail. Joe is with Trust a Trader. And there are thousands more just like him. In a quarter of a mile, keep right to stay on M4. Doing. Try Trust a Trader to find a verified local tradesperson with great reviews. You can always trust a trader. Cheers, Joe. We all have a fire inside us. It gives us energy and spirit to do the things we love. Every morning we get to... Keep right to stay on M4. ...for the day with a warming and satisfying bowl of Quaker Oats. Because when we feed it right, when it's fully ablaze, we can take on anything the day might bring. Feed more than just your body. Feed the fire inside. Quaker Oats. Making that first cup of coffee and feeling the heat from the kitchen tiles. Gently warm your bare feet. At Swale Heating, we help you stay warm. As well as installing efficient boilers, such as Worcester Bosch, we can provide underfloor heating too. Visit swaleheating.com. Rely on us to keep you warm. As millions held their breath, humanity takes its first steps on the moon. In your lifetime, you've witnessed science fiction become reality. It's now possible for everyone to have the internet in their pocket. Surgeons have successfully transplanted a human heart. But when it comes to heart disease, at the British Heart Foundation, we're just getting started. More than half our funding comes from gifts and wills. You can use the power of yours to help us fund life-saving breakthroughs to leave a lasting legacy and turn science fiction into reality again. It's 2024 and the British Heart Foundation has today announced the heart of the future. Search BHF Willpower to get a free gift and wills guide and see how you can get a solicitor's help in writing or updating your will for free. Mechanics, you know the money you got for that tune up? Cheers, mate. You've earned it. Physios, for putting your back into it. Oh, you've earned it. Plumbers, stuff or don't you oh, you've really earned it so why give so much of your hard-earned money away every time you take a payment low pay is the instant payment app with no monthly fees and rates from 0.79 percent less than half some charge download low pay now and get a free terminal you've earned it see lowpay.com for t's and c's oh, i've rinsed those first mate tom swarbrick on lbc with motorway offering free home collection when selling your car in a few moments, get more details about the police, crime, courts, and sentencing bill. Uh, in a quarter of a mile, keep right to stay on M4. We'll speak to Matthew Thompson about that in just a moment. Harry's in Waltham Forest. Hi, Harry. Good evening. Uh, what do you think the Russians hope to achieve by seizing the Chernobyl site? That's a very good question, and I think lots of people are asking precisely that, which may be precisely what they're trying to achieve. To, to do keep that. right to stay on M4 to hold something that they can, you know, pretend that something dodgy has happened at the plant and blame it on the Ukrainians. There are all sorts of ways they can play it. Continue on M4 for four miles. That it's standard military procedure to seize all critical national infrastructure and high-value locations so that they're under your control. Um, so, we'll see. It, it, uh, and clearly there's an issue with the taking hostage of those staff who work there. Is that because they need them to actually do, operate it, to, to keep the lights on? I mean, we genuinely don't know. It's odd. Um, I mean, yes, there's an argument to say you want to keep staff who know how to maintain a dangerous nuclear facility in good condition at the site. Um, but, yes, the fact that they have, have kept them there and not allowed them to communicate is um, concerning. Harry, good question. That's a question that I had as well. Thank you very much for it. Michael's in Ellesmere in Shropshire. Hi, Michael. Hi, uh, my question is, uh, how do you define a civilian once you throw a Molotov cocktail, for example, do you become a combatant? Um, essentially, yes, you do. And I think this is one of the... So, 
if somebody is in uniform and is uh, armed and is conducting military activity, um, so that even if that's you know, cooking food for soldiers, but they're in uniform and part of a command structure, then they're recognised as a combatant, um, which is why you're allowed to bomb soldiers when they're sleeping and so forth. Um, if you are not doing those things, you're not part of a command structure, and you are therefore a non-combatant, then there are all sorts of protections you have. As soon as you pick up a weapon and start engaging in military activity, soldiers are free to engage you in self-defense. So at that point, yes, you can be engaged. Um, From the end? By any means. Um, but of course, if you have thrown that and then you go back into the buildings and they can't identify who you are, um, and there are other civilians in that area, then that starts becoming legally much more complicated. Do you think Putin cares about any of that? No, not particularly. Come back to more of your questions in a few moments' time. I mentioned the fact that MPs are debating the police crime court and sentencing bill. That follows the government suffering over 20 defeats on it when it passed through the House of Lords uh, some while ago. Reporting live at LBC, our correspondent, Matthew Thompson. Matthew. So unlike few pieces of legislation in recent memory, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill has stirred up passions right across the country. Not many bills get their own hashtag, but for months, Kill the Bill has been ever-present on social media and on, of course, the placards of protests on the streets. But what on earth is in it to make it so controversial? Essentially, it's a sprawling document with proposals on a huge area of crime and justice, many of it aimed it has to be said at giving the government more powers to tackle protests. In two miles, at Junction 6, take the A355 exit to Slough Central. And the issues defeated by the Lords included giving the police the power to stop protests that were too noisy. Also a proposal to crack down on protests like Insulate Britain and Extinction Rebellion by making it illegal to lock yourselves to things. And that proposal and a number of others now can't actually be reintroduced by the government at all because... Arcane parliamentary rules mean that if amendments are introduced in the House of Lords and rejected by the House of Lords, well, they, they can't be put back in in the Commons. Although the government's already said that it has uh, every intention of bringing forward new legislation to essentially give them those powers. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other things the government will try to reintroduce tonight. Uh, and also, it has to be said, strip out some of the things that the Lords added in. Lords, of course, as you'll know, doesn't ultimately have the power to block the will of the Commons, merely to delay it. But there will be potentially some back and forth over the coming days and weeks. So tonight, several hours of debate scheduled for this bill back in the House of Commons, with some key votes expected late in the evening. The debate is firmly underway as we speak. It got a very late start because of a few ministerial statements on Russia. But in particular, debate is frenetic at the moment about one of the key amendments that the Lords put into the bill, which would make misogyny a hate crime in England and Wales. The government isn't supporting that amendment, and the policing minister, Kit, Kit, Kit Malthouse, explained a short time ago exactly why that is. Now, honourable members may be aware that at the government's request, the Law Commission provided recommendations on the reform of hate crime laws in December last year. Looking very carefully at this issue, it found that adding sex or gender to hate crime laws may, and I quote, prove more harmful than helpful, as well as counterproductive. The principal reason for this is that it could make it more difficult to prosecute the most serious crimes that harm women and girls, including rape and domestic abuse. Obviously, such an awful and unintended consequence is not the intention of those who place this amendment in the other place. Unfortunately... In a quarter of a mile, at Junction 6, take the A355 exit to Slough Central. So that's the view from the government. Labour's Stella Creasy, though, had some objections. He's highlighted there this issue of a carve-out as the reason why the government doesn't believe that adding sex or gender to make sure that any perpetrator, whether they attack a woman or somebody they believe to be a woman, can be captured by this offence, which I think... Exit at Junction 6. He's argued that the carve-out isn't the right thing to do. Does he also make the same argument that it is tokenistic to carve-out offences based on racial or religious hatred? Because we all In a quarter of a mile, at the roundabout, take the third exit onto Tuns Lane, A355. But I think that's just a flavour of quite how sprawling this bill is, Tom. It's everything from restrictions on insulate Britain protests to whether or not misogyny should be considered a hate crime. And the debate will doubtless go on late into the evening as it's such a wide-ranging bill with so many contentious issues. But by tomorrow morning, we should know a little bit more about what shape 
the bill, is it? LBC senior correspondent Matthew Thompson, thank you very much indeed. I'm live with Dr. Jack Watling, research fellow for land warfare at the Royal United Services Institute, taking your calls and your thoughts on what we're seeing so far play out in Ukraine. Christoph's in Wembley Park. Hi, Christoph. Hello, yes, uh, thanks. Um, I remember in the 80s, I think, and 90s, uh, a lot of hoo-ha over the so-called neutron bomb, uh, apparently designed to harm people that leave buildings standing. Uh, can Jack tell us about the intended use and the effects of a so-called tactical nuclear weapon? I've always found that an odd phrase, a tactical nuclear weapon. Jack. So in nuclear theory, you distinguish between uh, tactical nuclear weapons and strategic nuclear weapons. Strategic nuclear weapons are trying to essentially destroy an opponent's society, and so really high-yield nuclear devices, the kinds that would knock out cities. Tactical nuclear weapons... Exit the roundabout onto Tuns Lane. Silos ...or military units that in their assembly areas or bunkers, um, kind of control bunkers. And so in a quarter of a mile, slight left towards Sippenham Lane. ...in the geographic area that they affect, and you use them tactically to target military targets. Um, the Russians have that as a, as a part of their doctrine, um, and in the Cold War, the threshold for them employing those systems was very, very low if we ended up in a fight. And here? Well, as I say, this is why it's very important that we keep this as a regional, local conflict and not, in the Russian conception, a great power conflict, because the threshold for use is much more... Slight higher. left towards Sippenham Lane. The, um, the Russians, as I understand now, I don't understand a lot about it, but the Russians are able to, to have a lot of different types of missiles that, that can have nuclear parts applied. Continue for one and a half miles. Relatively recently, they were testing out hypersonic missiles. Are those the kinds of tools that Putin might want to use given they've invested in them and tested them and tried them? I don't think they'll use hypersonics in Ukraine because... Uh, Why they, would you? Yeah, the, you know, there, are, and there isn't anything that would intercept a normal missile, so why would you need one that's hypersonic? But also, they haven't made them accurate enough yet for ready to use for that. Um, the big concern are, are Iskanders, which they've already been using quite extensively. Iskander, Iskander, Iskander and uh, short-range ballistic missiles, yeah. And What's that? It's, it's essentially a, a large missile that will, you know, go over, say, 500 kilometers um, and has a large payload on it, but it can also have a nuclear payload. And, and this is one of the challenges is that Russian systems do allow you to put different payloads on mm -hmm. your weapons. Uh, John's in Brighton. John. Hello. Yeah, what is the effectiveness of these weapon systems we're hearing about that the West is supplying? Uh, I think Britain is supplying missiles, Germany is supplying a thousand missiles, I guess other countries as well. I've heard about Stinger missiles as well. What is the effect of this of these? Yeah, so um, they're, they're highly effective weapons. Uh, things like Javelin uh, is essentially a, a top attack anti-tank missile. So you can fire it uh, and it will then fly towards the tank, go into the air and strike from above uh, onto the weakest part of the tank, essentially. So it has a very, very high probability of kill, is what we would say. Um, other systems like the AT-4s that Sweden are sending are much simpler, just direct fire rockets. Um, but, of course, they, they require less training, and so that's important. But they're also easier to use in an urban environment, where you probably have a straight line to your target at fairly short range. Um, so these are, these are very capable systems. Let me just bring you a piece of uh, uh, news that is breaking at the moment. There, there are reports, these are just reports at this stage, but we were talking earlier about the talks that were taking place between Ukraine and Russia on, on the Belarusian border. Those talks have broken up. Uh, the suggestion was that the two sides would consult before then getting into more talks. And there are reports now that the next round of talks could happen in the coming days. So it's not over, it's not finished. Um, there is still more to discuss, so some hope. Uh, but clearly the coming days are going to involve then uh, the continuation of the war that we have seen thus far uh, in Ukraine. 03456060973 is the number. More of your calls in just a few moments. Tom Swarbrick here. It's 6.45. News headlines now. Amelia Cox. An extra 100,000 Ukrainians will be able to seek refuge in the UK following a relaxation of visa rules. The country's interior minister says dozens of people have been killed in shelling in Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv. And Boris Johnson has told President Zelensky more military support will be sent to Ukraine in the coming hours.
hours and days. LBC weather, rain moving southeast tonight, clear and cold elsewhere with isolated showers in the northwest, a low of minus two. LBC travel, I'm Dave Goff. There are queues on the M25 clockwise. There's a lane closed, the junction 30 for Lakeside on the exit slip road. That's because of an accident. On the M25 clockwise, it's also slow to junction 24 for Potters Bar. That's after a car broke down earlier on, but all the lanes are back open there. Anti-clockwise on the M25, there are queues towards junction 2 for the A2 after a vehicle broke down earlier on. There are delays in Greenwich heading towards the Blackhall Tunnel northbound. It's now partly blocked because a car's broken down in the tunnel. On the trains, C2 C have delays of up to 15 minutes and some cancellations at West Ham. That's after a fire alert earlier. And on the tube, there are minor delays on the Waterloo and City line. That's because a train has broken down. Coming up at 7 on LBC, Ian Dale. Vladimir Putin has raised the level of nuclear threat because Liz Truss thinks it's OK for David Dagenham to fight in Ukraine. Is it completely unhinged? Ian Dale on LBC. Unlike most networks, Tesco Mobile prices stay fixed throughout your contract. You could say they're as 